Okay, so this is paper two from the new specification. So this is the AS paper two. This isn't the A level one. It's the AS paper two um, of the the specimen papers. It's the set one. So it's not the second set that was released. That's uh, I think still locked. It is the first one, which is publicly available. Uh, the specimen paper, but paper two. Uh, so usual thing. Blah 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 blah. blah. Right. So. Question one, you've got compound J known as leaf alcohol has the structural formula CH3, CH2, CH, CH, CH2, CH2, OH and is produced in small quantities by many green plants. The E isomer of J is responsible for the smell of freshly cut grass. So give the structure of the E isomer of J. They're throwing you off on this one first of all, they're giving you this thing leaf alcohol. You have no idea what leaf alcohol is, you're not supposed to know what leaf alcohol is, it's just uh, compound J is all that you matter. But you're given the structural formula, so you're asked for the E isomer of J. So obviously E, when we're dealing with an E isomer, we need to be in a situation where we have right, in, yep, um, where we have our sort of functional groups that matter, if you like, or the around the double bond, we want to be across it. Um, so if we look at our double bond there, we've got our, okay, we can see we've got CH, CH, so we've got some hydrogen. So basically we want to be in this situation where we've got hydrogens going across and the remainder of the molecule there is going across like that, and that's our E isomer, uh, and that's going to be CH3, CH2, so CH3, CH2, uh, CH2, CH2OH, yeah. And that's it, one mark there. Obviously, getting the E isomer. If we had this here, up here, with the H down there, that would be the Z isomer, but this is obviously the E isomer that we're looking for. So give the skeletal formula of the organic product formed when J is dehydrated using concentrated sulfuric acid. Now the key thing here is that if we were to look at this is a, as a fully drawn out molecule, I'll do it fairly sort of sketchily. CH2, CH2, Oh wait, so CH3, CH2, CH, double bond, CH, CH2, CH2, OH. Right, it's this point here. This is the bit we're looking at. This is the sort of the alcohol portion of our um, alcohol, really, but with this uh, this uh, uh, double bond, I forgot what it was called, uh, double bond there. So it's this portion here where we're going to find the dehydration occurring. We're obviously going to take that away, um, and we end up losing this hydrogen here as well, so it's that adjacent hydrogen. So we end up with a double bond here. So our final product, basically, it's going to be destroying the carbons, is going to be that. But we need to draw it as a skeletal formula. So <coughs> this here is just going to be a line, line, one, two, three, four, Five, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So I draw that a bit neater. So it's going to be. There's my first carbon, my CH3 there, up to my CH2, down to my CH. Then we're double bonding. Then I'm. Um, so I'm here. So I've done CH3, CH2, C double bond, down to my CH, and then what will now become a double bond at the end. So that's it. That's your whole one mark there. But draw it out. Use, <coughs> draw it as a full um, sort of a kind of displayed formula but not. Uh, so you can work out what's going on. Don't just jump into one of these questions because you'll just, you'll just trip up and, and you'll lose silly marks. Uh, another structure of isomer, uh, another structural isomer of J is shown below. Blah blah blah. blah. Explain how the Kant Ingold prelog uh, CIP priority rules can be used to deduce the full UPAC name of this product. So I can't ingold prelog priority rules. Uh, they come into play when we haven't got obvious sort of hydrogens and hydrogens, and we've now obviously got different groups here. So ultimately, what you're doing is you're having to think about the easiest thing here is it's treating it as as a molecule, treating it as half molecule and half molecule. So deal with the left hand or the right hand first. Do the right hand. So we've got this group here and we've got this group. Now this is going to be the higher uh, priority group right here. But why is that the case? Well, it's the atomic number that's important. So atomic number here versus atomic number here, we've got 12 versus 1. So this is going to win. Okay, So this is the priority over there. 
So if you look at our left hand side now, a little bit more tricky because we have a carbon here bonded to a carbon, which would be the C of the CH2 and the carbon there. So that's not going to be enough to actually fix things. So what we do is we look one further bond away. Now in this case, the next bond is going to be to a hydrogen. Here we've got another carbon. So in this case, the carbon of the second portion there, the second alkyl group, or the second portion of the ethyl group there, that carbon has atomic number of 12, whereas our hydrogen that's bonded here is only one. So this is our priority portion here. That may be obvious, but obviously we're explaining this rather than anything else. And I'll come through with sort of a bit of an answer in a second. Bottom line there is that you are looking at the highest priority groups here being on the same um, side of the carbon carbon double bond. So ultimately we've got a Z isomer here. Then obviously we need to work out the name of this. So we are actually working out the name. Naming in this case is going to be, and I'll put the name first and then I'll run through how to work that out again. Uh, the naming here is going to be, let's have a look, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, so, 1, 2, 3, yeah, so we've got 5 carbons as our longest chain there, so our 5 carbons here, bam, 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 we've got double bond here on carbon number 2, and a alcohol group there on carbon number 1, now because it's a an alkene, alcohol then it has a slight difference name and rather than an anol it ends up being enol but you factor that into the name so it's going to be other groups joined we've got obviously a methyl group here on carbon number three so we're going to have three methyl and that's the one two three four five it's on the third carbon then we have as you would normally do then uh, it's pent and we'd normally call it maybe pentanol uh, but it's not in this case it's going to be Pent, we've got to give the position of the double bond here, which is 2, and then rather than an, it's N. So what we've got here, this pent 2, the 2 is given as the position of the double bond, and then it's a 1 ol. So we've got a situation there where we've named now where the alcohol group is. So once more, methyl group on the third carbon of our longest chain of 5, which is going across there where my line is drawn. So 3-methyl, pent 2, to give us the double bond, and 1-ol. So running through that again, you're comparing two different sides. So you're looking at the, this, either one first, doesn't matter, right-hand side, looking for the priority of the carbons, or the the atoms joined to the carbon of the double bond. We find that this has the highest atomic number of 12 versus 1, therefore the priority is there. Same principle on this side, but rather than easy hydrogen, we've got another carbon here. So we go one bond across, then we go one bond, we find we've got a carbon there versus a hydrogen here. So therefore our highest priority is up there. Same reasons, our atomic number being different. Ultimately, that gives us a Z isomer because they're on the same side of the double bond. And this is our name here. So six months. So I'm not going to write a full answer out there. Um, but I think I've gone through enough detail there as to what's going on. Uh, and we'll move on to 1.4. Don't like this new numbering system. Effective gentle heat on malic or malic malic. I don't know where you say that. Acid is shown below. So this is, our, I'm assuming, malic acid, and this is the effect of gentle heat. We've got a water given out there. Uh, student predicted the yield of this reaction would be greater than 80%. In an experiment, 10 grams of malic, malic, this acid, were heated, and 6.53 grams of organic product were retained. Is the student correct? Just for your answer with the calculator using these data. Right. Two marks there. So we're not talking about too much work. Or actually, I say that specimen papers, you're probably talking about a week's worth of work. So, we need to work out, first of all, the moles, essentially, of malic acid or malic acid and what we would expect to get. So, we need to work out our expected um, mass of the organic product there. And then we can compare that and work out our actual yield and see if the student is or is not correct. So, we need to add up find the MR of our delightful product of our malic acid there, which we're going to have oxygens, we've got double bonds and all the rest, so we've got 16, 16, I think we're looking at about 116 
So we've got 16, 16, 16, 16. Don't get tripped up by what's going on here. Obviously, we've got carbons. Make sure you've got your four bonds so you know where you've got your hydrogens and where you've not got your hydrogens. Uh, we come up with 116 there. So we're going to work out our moles of maleic acid. So moles of maleic is going to be usual mass divided by MR. So 10 divided by 116. That comes out 8.62 times 10 to the minus 2. Ratio here. 1 to 1, so that's nice and easy. So our moles of our organic products are 8.62 times 10 to the minus 2 as well. So mass of organic product, switch around our calculation slightly there, mass is moles times MR. So we're going to find 8.62 times 10 to the minus 2 times by our MR of our organic product, which having already looked at this, I know is 98. And that gives us our value of 8.45 grams. Now, annoyingly, this whole process there is only going to get you one mark. Uh, second mark then is for actually sort of working out our yield and ultimately stating whether the student is correct. So our yield is going to be, or our percentage yield for this one would be, um, We've produced expectedly, theoretically, we would get 8.45. So that's our expected. In reality, we've produced 6.53 times by 100, of course, because it's a percentage. And we come out with a number of 77.3 rounded. That clearly is less than 8, uh, 80%. So you, you've got to say, you've got to answer this question. So no, student wrong that's an exclamation mark student wrong no no um, if you don't put that statement but you get this mark you're actually going to not get this second one you need to have this correct uh, percentage and the statement because it is asking that is the student correct that is the question really so two marks there not too bad uh, going on I think we're on question two now where are we question two figure one shows Apparatus used in experiments to determine the enthalpy of combustion of leaf alcohol. Still on leaf alcohol. What's the obsession with leaf alcohol? How many questions? Uh, so, we've got a burner. We're heating up some water. So straight away, I'm looking at this and I'm going, Q is MC delta T because we're heating up stuff, specifically capacity, blah, 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 blah. And obviously it does talk about enthalpy of combustion here. So we are ultimately going to need to convert our Q to an enthalpy. Now, I've, not, I've never seen this paper before really I've not spent any time looking at this uh, but that's straight away jumping out at me so I've got a grams of water I'm told there's a constant height here and I've got my burner there uh, alcohol, alcohol is placed in this do note as well that I'm actually reading these parts of the questions don't ignore this bit and go right where's the question where 2.1 actually properly read these parts because it is important these numbers here that I'm assuming is going to be important at some point so alcohol is placed in the spirit burner and it is weighed. The burner is lit and the alcohol is allowed to burn for a few minutes. The flame is extinguished and the burner is re-weighed. So we're working out there, in case you're not aware, you're working out how much alcohol has burned, the mass of alcohol that has actually burned, which is going to be important when it comes to working out our enthalpy change. The flame is extinguished, the temperature of water is recorded before and after heating, of course, to give us our delta T, which is going to be our difference between this initial and final temperature. So we've got a couple of things there. We've got masses... Uh, before and after and we've got uh, temperatures before and after so write an equation first off the complete combustion of leaf alcohol so complete combustion great we know that complete combustion is going to produce us because we've got a carbon hydrogen oxygen doesn't matter but carbon hydrogen so we're going to produce co2 and hut off so we can work out we can look at the balancing aspect of that in a bit um, I would probably write this out in total um, the mark scheme actually has it condensed down. Um, I'm, either one's fine, doesn't matter what you want to put here. But this guy is going to go there. I will condense it down just so you can see um, kind of what's going on. A little bit easier to do it this way, only because then actually you can work out. So I can see I've got six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and one oxygen there. Of course, I'm reacting it with oxygen. The way you balance this, always the same. Balance your carbons first. 6 to match your 6. We've got 12 hydrogens. This also needs a 6. Now it already easy. We've got 12 there, 6 times 2, so 12 oxygens. We've got 6 there, so that's 18 in total. We've got 
one here, so this needs to account for 17, so we're going to have, that is the worst 8 I've ever seen, 8.502 oh there. And that is going to give us one nice easy mark. Flipping it down, calculate a value for the enthalpy of combustion of leave alcohol, give units in your answer. So, what we're going to do is, we're going to first of all work out, well we're going to use Q is MC delta T. But the problem we've got, and don't get confused with the masses on this, this is not the mass we use, it's the mass of water being heated, so it's 50 grams. So we'll put that in. I know my specific heat capacity of water, 4.18. What is my delta T? Okay, I'm going to have to work out delta T. Do this as a separate section. 40.8, 20.7. So, that's what, 20.1. Put that number in here. Calculate that, and you come out with a value of here 4201, and that's joules. That is joules, and that's important that not necessarily that you include it there, but that certainly you are aware that this is joules, not kilojoules, because you should know enthalpy of combustion is in kilojoules per mole. So we are going to have to do a little bit of a conversion there. At this point, you could say, right, 4201 joules, uh, it's 4.201 kilojoules. doesn't really matter whether you do it at this point, but you are going to have to do that at some point. So, we know that when my alcohol burned, it released, it transferred into the water, 4.201 kilojoules of energy. But I need to work out as an enthalpy of combustion for that alcohol burning, and that's in kilojoules per mole. Now, we may have one mole of, has burned, but we don't know, so we've got to check that. So let's go up here. So my final mass of spirit burn was 55.84, my initial was 56.38, so 56.38. So let's mass of alcohol burn is going to be 56.38, I think the number was, minus 55.84. So we do that, we maths that, uh, and you're going to come out with value of... 0.54. You are going to need an MR. So our MR of the leaf alcohol is 100, which we are going to need because we are going to have to work out with our mass here our number of moles that have burned. Now it may be one mole that's been burned, but that would be quite lucky and, and not a lot of calculation involved, um, or it'd be less calculation involved later on. So, I've got my mass of alcohol that's burnt, 0.54. Let's work out my moles of alcohol burnt. My moles is mass over MR, so 0.54 over 100. Uh, nice, easy sum there. So, I'm just going to have 0.0054 moles that were burnt. Now, that clearly isn't one mole. So, what this is telling me at this point is that I know that for every 0.0054 moles of leaf alcohol that are burned, 4.201 kilojoules of energy are released which is fine, but it's not a very good unit, and it certainly isn't the unit of enthalpy of combustion, which enthalpies are measured in kilojoules per mole. So I've got to convert my this here, so I know that my 4.201 per 0.0054 moles, kilojoules, I've got to convert that so it's X per 1 mole, and that is essentially what kilojoule per mole is saying. So I've got to convert that. The easiest way to do anything like this is you take your number, you divide it by itself. Because if I divide 0.0054 moles by 0.0054 moles, I get to one mole, which is great. So if I do f to fact that across the other side here, because uh, if this I'm changing in that, uh, I'm factoring this in that respect, I've got to do the same for 4.201. So 4.201 divided by 0.0054 is going to give me a number of 778, I believe. Yeah, that comes out of 778. So that now is 778 per mole, which is great because that's 778 kilojoules per mole. And then we whack our answers into here. There's my enthalpy combustion, 778, my units, kilojoule. Per mole. You could have calculated this all in joules, but I think that's a little bit sloppy actually, because actually it should be in kilojoules, because that's what, by definition really, it needs to be given in that sense. The final point there, and actually there's one bit that I've almost missed there, 
is this whole process is great but the problem is these numbers here don't account that the Q value never accounts whether it's an exothermic or an endothermic reaction which is not the fault really of Q is because the temperature change whether it goes up or down is always going to be a positive number so you're always going to come out with a positive number but we know in this our final temperature was 40.8 and our starting was 20.7 we know it's combustion so it's an exothermic process which means our enthalpy change must be negative therefore minus 778 with kilojoules per mole and that's going to get you four marks there's not actually that much work there I've sort of made it uh, much longer than it need be but it's not too bad uh, state how your answer for question 2.2 .2 is likely to differ from the value quoted in reference sources. Right, how is it likely to differ from reference source? So, reference sources, we're talking about date of book values. So, my value, is my value going to be the same or is it going to be less? It's probably going to be less negative. And the reason for that is, we're probably going to have found that actually... In reality, if we did this properly, um, and by properly I mean not like this, as this is burning, it's all very well, but heat is going out there, it's going out there, some, of course, is going in there, but a lot is being lost. This is now nice and hot, this is hot. Um, some will just remain in the, you know, this may be a bit warmer. So that's all energy that we're assuming is going into there, but it's not, it's escaping. So the easiest one here really is it's less negative. Uh, and reason, one reason for your answer, heat loss. Other things you could write, you could write incomplete combustion. That's a that's a fair value there. Uh, combustion could have been incomplete, which means therefore obviously your numbers are skewed as a result. Uh, Mark's scheme has evaporation. Popping out, evaporation of alcohol, i.e., skewing the mass there. Um, I would go heat loss, and that's always a really good, uh, a really good answer to to have there. And that's two easy marks. Uh, so we're going through two point two point four. Good. Fifty grams uh, of water was used in this sem in this experiment. Expe explain how you could measure out this mass of water without using a balance. It's a very sneaky question. Because um, it's saying, how can you measure a mass without using a balance? Well, you could measure the volume of it. 50 grams of water has the volume of 50 centimetres cubed. Um, so measure 50 centimetres cubed. How do you, how can you do that? Well, water has a density of one gram per centimetre cubed. Therefore, every gram of water weighs, uh, every centimetre cubed sorry, of water weighs one gram, so therefore 50 centimetres cubed of water is the same as 50 grams of water. There you go. 2.4. Is 2 continuing? No, we're on question 3. This is lovely. Okay, so we've got 2 bromo, 2 methyl pentane is heated with potassium hydroxide dissolved in ethanol. Straight away I'm looking at elimination there. I'm going elimination! Uh, but we'll see. Two structural isomers are formed. Set the meaning of the term structural isomers. So what does structural isomer mean? Well, there's a kind of there's a standard definition for this that you need to sort of be well aware of. Same and it's only one mark here, same molecular formula um different structural formula. I like that. So it means as the same number of uh, whatever it be, carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, bromines, chlorines, but they're essentially arranged differently. This one, name mechanism, as I already said, it's going to be elimination. I know this is elimination and not nucleophilic substitution because I've got potassium hydroxide in ethanol and it's heated. So it's hot and it's in ethanol, which says elimination. If I'd got dilute potassium hydroxide solution, i.e. in water, and it was cold, then I'd be looking at this being a nucleophilic substitution reaction, but it's not. Mechanism. So draw, name and draw the mechanism. So I've named it. Good. Mechanism. What have I got? 2-bromo-2-methylpentane. So, 2-bromo, 1-2-3, 2-bromo, I shall do it this way, 2 methyl Pentane, that's annoying, isn't it? I'll do it ridiculously like this. 
So two bromo, two methyl, pentane. One, two, three, four, five. Good. Two bromo, two methyl. I'll just check that out. I've got that right. Two bromo, two methyl, pentane. Good. So what's going to happen? Well, my hydroxide is going to come in and it is going to attack the hydrogen attached to the carbon that is adjacent to the carbon attached to the halogen. Yeah. Now, I always think of this as some sort of weird cascady type thing going on. It doesn't really matter which way you do this. Um, but essentially, our hydroxide here, got to have as a lone pair, whoop, comes in, attacks this hydrogen here, or this one, doesn't matter. That then kind of goes straight down onto there, and that then kicks back like so. So we've got three arrows there. We've got a hydroxide coming in, and we've got coming down and across. Now, the astute amongst you will be aware that actually I could have done this on the other side. The hydroxide could have attacked this hydrogen, and that would have come down like that, and that same process there. Now, obviously, it just asks you to draw for one of the isomers. So either of those is correct, and that's going to get you four really simple marks. Okay, Your marks there are going to be for your arrows, and it's going to be for your correct structure as well. Oh, that is that is a sneaky mark. They normally give you that one, so you, you've got to actually draw your structure as well. So one, two, three, four, five. I'll do a stick with mine that I initially did there, so it's going to be one, two, three... Uh, one, two, three, one, two, one, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, good. So yeah, that's essentially the structure of the product that I, in particular there, have got, because I chose to attack that. If you did the other way around, then of course your double bond would be on the end there rather than being where I have put it. Okay, turn over to the next question. Oh, straight into question four now. That was a very short question, wasn't it? That was ridiculous, just 3.2. So four, glucose can decompose in the presence of microorganisms to form a range of products. One of these is a carboxylic acid with an MR of 88 containing 40.9% of carbon and 4.5% sorry, of hydrogen by mass. Ah, oh, good, I like this. It's just empirical and molecular formulas of the carboxylic acid form. So. Straight away, I know that it's got carbon, I know it's got hydrogen, because it's a car carboxylic acid, I know I've got to have some oxygen involved there as well. My carbon is 40.9, my hydrogen is 4.5, my oxygen, therefore, is the difference between 100 and taking away from it these two, which gives me 54.6, and there's my numbers. Now, I'm assuming these are percentages, but if you imagine you had a 100 gram sample, these are grams, so just go with these as grams. Do your moles of each, so moles of carbon, moles of hydrogen, moles of oxygen. And we do 40.9 divided by 12. We do 4.5 divided by 1. We do 54.6 divided by 16. There are numbers. And we come out with 3.41, 4.5, 3.41. Now, the way we do this now, always divide by your smallest number. So now the smallest number here is 3.41. So that comes out with a ratio of 1 to something, to obviously 1. This number here isn't quite as nice. 1.32. Blah. No one likes that. At this stage, if you round that down to 1, you've just thrown all these marks away. It's an absolute stinker. Don't do that. You've basically got to turn this sort of into the, into the best whole number ratio you can. Now in this case, um, your best one there is going to be multiplying these all by three. Now that's just a bit of a sort of trial and error type thing, really. It's a, it's a, there's no easy way, I don't think, to sort of to get you to that point. Um, you can end up with three to three point nine six to three. Probably one of the more mean empirical formula questions. This you can round. That's fine. So our ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen is three to four to three. That means it's going to be obviously C3H4O3. So that's my empirical formula. So I can write that in there. C3H4O3. 
O3. Now, that may not be the molecular formula. I'm given the MR of the carboxylic acid. So let's add these together and work out if this is the correct uh, actual substance. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking it may actually be. Look at the number. So 12 times 3, add 4, add 16 times 3. So that's 36, add 4, add 48. And that comes out at 88. Therefore, my molecular formula is actually the same as my empirical formula in that particular instance. Okay, easy. Four marks there, not too bad at all, I don't think. Going down, ethanol is formed by the fermentation of glucose. A student carried out this fermentation reaction in the beaker using an aqueous solution of glucose at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius in the presence of yeast. We write an equation of the reaction occurring during fermentation. So, the reaction occurring. This is... Um, it's it's one really that you, you you should really know. So our glucose C six H twelve O six. You need to know that there's no reactants involved there. Okay, no reactants. We are producing ethanol. Uh, I'm going to write it as CH three CH two O H, and we're going to produce some CO two, and then we need to balance that up. So our balancing is going to be two. It's going to be a two. One mark. Easy though. <laughs> 4.3. In industry, this fermentation reaction is carried out at 35 degrees Celsius rather than 25 degrees Celsius. Just one advantage and one disadvantage for industry of carrying out the fermentation at this higher temperature. Okay. Why would you do so any any why would you do it hotter than anything? Well, it's a faster rate. And obviously of ethanol production, which is good. But as with anything, even though you might say oh, it's only 35 degrees, it is therefore going to require more energy. So, more energy used. So, faster, but it does take more energy. Obviously, you would need to, in terms of the industry doing this, they would want to work out whether the more ethanol produced was going to make them more money taken into account, the more money they're going to have to spend on the energy, the electricity, or whatever it be. Um, and that's, that's up to them, obviously. I mean, I'm not making ethanol. Um, by fermentation, so I don't have to worry about those things. 4.3, 4.4. Uh, the method used for the student in question 4.2 will result in the ethanol being contaminated by ethanoic acid. Damn. How? Why? So the question 4.2, fermentation. Why is ox? Oh, I've just ruined that. I'm trying to be coy and clever there. Oxidations occurring basically. You look at ethanol. You look at ethanoic acid. You should think right. Ethanol can be oxidised to ethanol, which can be oxidised to ethanoic acid. So how does it occur? Oxidation. Um, ultimately, air getting in really is, is oxidation. I, I would also accept microbes. That's not on the mark scheme, but microbes, uh, bacteria, whatever, cause oxidation. But oxidation is occurring basically. Um, the ethanol is becoming ethanoic acid, which ultimately is why actually, if you have a bottle of wine, you leave it out. I'm pretty sure that's why after a while it starts tasting like vinegar, uh, and it gets pretty disgusting because the ethanol gets oxidized to ethanoic acid. 4.5. Give two differences between the infrared spectrum of carboxylic acid and that of an alcohol other than in their fingerprint region. So obviously the fingerprint region is the classic one. It's unique for every molecule. And we can use that to deduce a molecule, but we need to have the fingerprint region of the molecule already known in order to sort of overlap it. Just like if I uh, rob someone uh, and I leave fingerprints all over their house, they need to have my fingerprints on record to actually do me for the crime. They can't just go, oh, those fingerprints look like um, this guy is or whatever. You need to have that there. It's the same principle with uh, the infrared spectrum. But the general sort of obviously the, the, the peaks, troughs, whatever you want to call them, they are actually linked into the particular substances. So we can look for carbonyl groups, we can look for uh, amino groups, we can look for carbon carbon double bonds, or whatever, OH groups, all that. So we've got a carboxylic acid and we've got an alcohol. So give two differences between the infrared spectrum. Well, straight away, we know that in a carboxylic acid, we've got that carbonyl group, that C double bond O. So, C double bond O in carb acid. Uh, and where is that absorption going to take place? Well, it's in that region of 1680 to 1750. That's the one that I would look at first. The other one is um, the OH groups are different. OH in alcohol is at... What are we looking at there? 3230, 3550, uh, and but in acid, that's like a the same bit there, OH in, is going to be at 2500 to 3, 
So that's actually a super easy question. Um, and anything with infrared spectroscopy actually is, is quite straightforward because they're never going to ask you loads of details about the process. They're just going to get you to spot things uh, using your data sheet, really. So it's it's not too bad. And they're, they're even telling you, you know, use table A on your data sheet. You, you're not going to remember these numbers unless you decide to learn them, which is ridiculous. Don't do that. Uh, use the data sheet. Use it correctly. Obviously, don't make any mistakes. Uh, we're now to question five. I have no idea how many questions there are on this paper. Um, it could, could be a thousand. So... Tetrachloromethane or carbon tetrachloride, however you want to call it, is an effective fire extinguisher, but it's no longer used because of its toxicity, that's a bad thing, and its role in the depletion of the ozone layer, also bad. In the other, So, looking like we're going to go to some sort of... No, no, maybe not. Because of its toxicity and its role in the depletion of the ozone layer. In the upper atmosphere, a bond in CCL4 breaks and a reactive species is formed. Well, I wonder what bond breaks. There's only, there are, there's only one type of bond in it. This is ridiculous. So what condition in the atmosphere is causing this bond to break? Well, this is all doing, it's all relating to um, free radical substitution. It's, in that it's UV light. So UV light. And the equation is going to be CCL4 breaks down into C oh God, CCL3 and one of these guys. Now, where would that be? I personally think that should go there. They've put it up there. It's strictly speaking, I think the free radical portion is actually on the carbon. I'm going to stick with that. Uh, and there's your chlorine there. So that's actually the free radical species that we're, we're I think, more concerned about. Right, two equations to show this species actually the catalyst. You should know, this is one of those you are expected to know how actually the the ozone is, 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 is depleted, how it's broken down. So our little guy here, chlorine, 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 chlorine free radical comes in, reacts directly with ozone producing this chlorate sort of radical thing and oxygen this guy then comes it's like double attack bam hits another ozone that creates this guy and more oxygen so it's great we make loads of oxygen um, but we're depleting quite a lot of ozone there so how is acting as a catalyst well the species is this guy here Although it's being used up here, it's being reformed. So actually he remains at the end and then can be go back in, bam, bam, bam. So one, one in theory, one chlorine atom, that's all this is, it's a chlorine atom, can go through and do this. And every time one chlorine atom, well, one chlorine atom could deplo deplete in theory, I suppose, the entire ozone layer. It would take a while, uh, but one is every time it reacts and is reformed, two ozone, layer, ozone molecules are being, uh, being used up, depleted. A small amount of... The Freon CF3CL with a mass of 1.78 times 10 to the minus 4 kilogram escaped from the refrigerator. Oh no, into a room of volume. Okay, so straight away, I'm guessing, although I might be completely wrong here. I don't know, we'll see. So a small amount of the Freon, I thought we were going to go ideal gas, but we're not. A small amount of the Freon CF3CL with a mass of 1.78 times 10 to the minus 4 kilograms escaped from the refrigerator into a room of volume of 100 meters cubed. Assuming that the Freon is evenly distributed throughout the air in the room, calculate the number of Freon molecules in a volume of 500 centimeters cubed. Give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. Right. So first of all, we're going to have to work out the number of moles of Freon that we've got there. So we've got a mass and we've got the molecular formula. Um... So we can work out the moles. Go away. We can work out the moles of freon. So moles of freon are going to be mass, which is going to be 1.78 times uh, 10. I'm trying to work out. I'm trying to do it in my head, and it's not working. I think it's times 10 to the minus 1 because we've got to account that this is kilograms. We need to convert into grams. Therefore, we're times it by a thousand, basically. Uh, so 1.78 times 10 to the minus 4 times 1,000 uh, divided by the MR, which I know is 104.5. That's the MR of Freon. So that comes out of a value of 1.70 times 10 to the minus 3. So I know that in this mass here, I have 1.7 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of Freon. Now I know that in any in one mole of any substance, I have this number of particles. So in this mass, I have 1.7 times 10 to the minus 3 times 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules of Freon. So, that's what I say. I say molecules of 
three on. It's going to be my moles, so 1.7 times 10 to the minus 3, times 6.02 times 10 to the 23. And that's going to give me uh, a lot of molecules. 1.02 times 10 to the 21. So that's the number of molecules that I've got in my leak. Now, that's in a room of size 100 meters cubed. Now, there's horrible conversions here. What we're actually looking is, that's great, well, we need that, but then we need to then factor that to the fact that it's actually 500 centimetres cubed, not 100 metres cubed, which is bizarre they've done. They've, they've done it purely just to add a bit more maths into it. I think the AQA, I think all of the exam boards were told they needed more maths. Uh, apparently AQA were massively uh, lacking in maths, uh, needed more maths in their... Um, uh, in their specifications, in their in their question papers, so they have put lots more maths in. Conversions. This is how I convert meters cubed to centimeters cubed. If you know that one meter cubed is a meter by a meter by a meter, and you know that one meter is 100 centimeters, then one meter cubed is the equivalent of one by one by one, or it's 100 by 100 by 100 centimeters. So it's one million centimeters. Cubed. So the conversion of one meter cubed to one me uh, centimeter cubed, oh sorry, conversion of meters cubed to centimeters cubed is you multiply by a million and you divide by a million the other way around. So if I'm converting from meters cubed to centimeters cubed, so I would say that right, 100 meters cubed is, let's see if I can work this one out, so 100 meters cubed would be 100 million centimeters cubed and that's the same they're the same thing so I know that in 100 million centimeters cubed I have 1.02 times 10 to the 21 but I'm asked for 500 centimeters cubed so I've got to divide this right right down okay I've got to proper divide it down so I've got to divide this what I would probably do because I'm a bit of a simple chap um, and this works for me I would probably say right we'll divide by a million and times by five that I think would work, would it not? 100 million, yeah, divide by a million times by five. So if I do 1.02 times 10 to the 21, divide by that would divide by a million would be 100 centimeters cubed times by five should be five centimeters, yeah. And that should give us out an answer of 5.1 times 10 to the 15 which it does. Boom. Nice. That's your molecules there, you're just whacking that in there. 5.3 done. Oh, now on to question 6. Dodecane, C12H26, is a hydrocarbon found in the naphtha fraction of screwed up. Dodecane can be used as a starting material to produce a wide variety of useful products. The scheme of figure 2 shows how one such product, polymer Y, can be produced from dodecane. Reaction 1 and reaction 2. So we've got reactions here can ignore them for a second because I don't know what they're going to ask me about that but I've got X here they're probably going to want me to find X or something related to that soon so name the polygon series that both C2H4 and C488 belong to seriously a real question um, draw a functional group isomer of C4H8 that does not belong to this molecular series nice I like this question so straight away they're alkenes alkenes you know have double bonds in them um, but there's another way of drawing this uh, CNH2N, uh, which actually is an alkane, and it's this. Cyclo groups have the same uh, uh, what do you call it? General formula CNH2N. So C4H8, boom, and this would be what's called cyclobutane. Uh, we don't need to name it, but there we go, two marks. So functional group isomer, because it's no longer got the double bond functional group. There are other ways to do it. You could do a cyclopentane uh, with a methyl group on it. It's up to you, really, but I would probably stick with the butane there, the cyclobutane. Identify compound X. Now, compound X is quite an easy one. All we've got to do is look for a bit of addition here. Uh, you'd have done this, hopefully, sort of when you were when you were little in year 10, 11 and things. C12H26, so I've already got six, so I know this must be C6, because I've got two and four, that's six. 12 in total, so it must be six. Four and eight is 12, I'm missing 14. C6H14, that's it. I mean, considering that's an A-level question, that is nice, one mark there. Name polymer Y, polymer Y. So, we've got one, two, three, four. 
normally this would come from the monomer of butene. So polymer Y is going to be, but bear in mind butene isn't just called butene. Oh, nearly tripped myself up there. Polymer Y is going to be poly, not polybutene, it's going to be polybutene. Because obviously you could have butene and we could have butene. It's important obviously to name where that is. But polybutene, easy, just putting poly on the front of it. Reaction 1 is an example of thermal cracking and is carried out at a temperature of 750 degrees Celsius. State one of the reaction condition needed pressure. High pressure. Got excited there. High pressure. Reaction 2 is exothermic. Ooh. So it's exothermic in the forward direction. Let's have a look. Typical compromise temperature of 200 degrees Celsius is. Oh, look at this six mark question. Oh, that makes me want to cry. So. Explain the effect of a change of temperature on both position of equilibrium and rate of reaction. Justify why a compromise temperature is used industrially. Uh, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly just to save a bit of time. I'm not going to write this as a proper answer as you would as you would need to do, but I'll just make just make my points really. So think about it first off. In there's three things to think about. There's to think about equilibrium. There's to think about rate, and there's ultimately why do you use a compromise? So start with equilibrium. So equilibrium, we know that the forward reaction is exothermic and we are ultimately trying to produce this polymer. So a high temperature would favour, um, hold on, shift, position of equilibrium left, which is bad. So that would shift the position of equilibrium to the left, okay? Um, because from the Chatelier's principle, we know that the equilibrium will oppose uh, because oppose increase in temp, which is fine. So ideally, we would want to use a low temperature because a low temperature would shift the position of equilibrium to the right because it opposes the decrease in temperature, which is great. That would give us more of our polybute toine, which is exactly what we want. So a higher temperature, just as a change of temperature, doesn't say whether it's higher or lower. That's Ridiculous. Oh, they are accepting, I'm just looking at the mark screen, they are accepting the opposite answer for lower. So it's up to you how you want to answer this. So if you answer it in terms of higher, you would say that the higher temperature shifts position of equilibrium to the left um, because uh, that's the endothermic direction and it's because it's opposing the increase in the temperature. This would give a lower yield of the, I've lost it now, where is it, of the polymer Y, which is polybute 2 in. Rate of reaction. How does this work? Well, when we deal with rate, if we stick with a higher temperature, a higher temperature equals faster rate. Now, it's not very explained, is it? So why is that equals a faster rate? Well, at a higher temperature, molecules have more energy. Therefore, the collisions are more likely to be successful because they're likely to have more energy uh, than the activation energy. More molecules would be in that situation. Therefore, we've got more successful collisions, faster rate of reaction which is great, and you just need to basically explain that. Again, you could do the opposite for lower temperature, but I would stick with one for both of these. Ultimately then, and I've whisked through this quite quick, but actually it's quite an easy six mark question. Your conclusion is along the idea, if you're trying to balance what is a good yield with how fast you would get that yield. So it's all right saying, oh look, We'll get a proper good, proper good, you know, rate of reaction going on if we use a high temperature. But in using a high temperature, you're going to get a really poor yield. But if you use a low temperature, which is going to give you a great yield, you're going to get a really slow rate of reaction. So you're trying to find a balance point where actually, from a monetary point, an economic point of view, you're not spending too much money. Well, you're ultimately getting enough of a yield quick enough that actually, therefore gives you a good turnover. You don't want to be in a situation where you get a great yield but it takes you three years to get it uh, and you don't want to get a poor yield but you get it within a couple of seconds uh, because you want to find a, a sort of an in-between balance and that's essentially what we've got here. We're trying to be cost effective to balance a yield and with the with the suitable rate. So that's actually quite a nice question. Uh, anyway, I'll flip on now question seven. The student carried out an experiment, hopefully this is finished soon. 
Student carried out an experiment to determine the number of carbon-carbon double bonds in a molecule of coconut by measuring the volume of bromine water. Oh, they had this in a GCC question once. Student followed these instructions. Use a drop and pipette to add five drops of oil to five centimeters cube of inert and organic solvent in a conical flask. Use a funnel to fill a burette with bromine water. Add bromine water from burette to the solution in the conical flask and swirl the flask into each addition to measure the volume of bromine water that is decolorized. Student results are shown in table two. Table two. In a trial experiment, the student failed to fill the burette correctly so that the gap between the tap still contained air. Okay, so what effect does this have on the measured volume of bromine in this trial? Okay, so the measured volume of bromine would be higher. Uh, and the reason for that is that if you imagine a, I'll try and badly draw a burette here, this is the sort of tap region there. This is our nozzle. Great word. Love the word nozzle. This is a bubble. Okay, I see an orange as well. Look. This is our bromine water here. Now, ideally, we'd want this to be right down to the end, but it's not. This bubble here, and that is actually affecting the volume. So, this, if we go right up to the top, and this is meniscus, this is measuring 41, dead on. Actually, this may account for 0.4. So, actually, in reality, the bromine there is 30... 6.4... I don't know, yeah. Basically, the volume of bromine there is less than we think, so it's it's going to make, this air is going to make the reading, it's pushing this higher up than it would normally be. It would drop, without this air here, it would drop down, in my case, 0 0.4, because I'm saying that's what, or 0 0.3, or whatever I said, that is in here. So it's making the reading higher than it should have been. Um, explain your answer. Yeah, okay, okay, so the explanation here is that it's pushing up, but actually uh, 0.4 of this, okay, if we release this, if I'm sticking with 0.4, that 0.4 fills this space before it leaves. So we would fill this air pocket first, and then we start to distribute. But still, when we look at the value here, 41 will have gone down. Even if we filled this and, and nothing came out, 41 will have actually dropped down to 41.4. Uh, although none have come out, but actually when we measured this, we would find that 41.4 was our new value, so we would measure 0 0.4 having been released. So it's a bit of a sort of a strange, one. very practical question that one, um, but not too difficult of a question either. Uh, 7.2, other than incorrect use of burettes, just reason for the inconsistency in the student's results. Right, well let's look back at what's happened. So he's using a drop and pipette to add five drops of oil. That's pathetic. You can't just use a pipette to add five drops of oil. A drop isn't a, isn't a unit of measurement, so drop sizes could vary and that obviously is, is, is fairly pathetic as far as an experiment goes you're not going to get very good results there at all unless you can guarantee the size of each drop which of course you can't outline how the student could improve this practical procedure to determine the number of carbon carbon double bonds in an oh god and the molecules of the oil so that more consistent results are obtained so what could the student do okay so Essentially, what what you're trying to do, really, as you hopefully there, the idea of drop size is varying. We're trying to eradicate that. So rather than using just random here, let's add a volume. So um, choose volume of oil. Um, dissolve in the solvent as was before. Then we're going to make it into a volumetric solution. So make standard solution using more solvent um, yeah we'll do it in a volumetric flask or just a conical flask either would work um, and then titrate we'll titrate against it using the bromine water so what we're doing is we're, we're, we're cutting out that sort of the chaff we're choosing a proper volume of oil there we then are actually using proper numbers and we can work stuff out basically using what we know is now a 250 centimeter cubed sample we titrate say 25 centimeter cubed samples from that using the bromine water and we're getting real good data there that's super accurate provided that we do everything obviously accurately uh, super accurate results as opposed to just oh just do some random bits and all this it's quite pathetic really this, this five drops of oil so that's really about the best thing you could do in that uh, to actually improve what's going on.
Uh, so some calculations now. 7.4. The oil has a density of 0.92 grams centimeter cubed. Each of the five drops of oil has a volume of. So they are saying now actually the volume, the drops are of the same volume. Boo! Some good maths going on here. So the oil has a density. Okay, so let's use some of these numbers that we've got here. So we know the density of our oil, and we know ultimately the volume of our oil. Um, so we've got five drops. We need to times this by five. So the volume of so we'll straight away, let's work out a mass of oil. Because we can see obviously density ties together mass and volume. So mass of oil is going to be 0.92 times by five times five times ten to the minus two. So what I'm doing there is I'm accounting for the five drops. Uh, and my density there, and I'm going to come up with a number there of 0.23 grams of oil. So I know I've got 0.23 grams of oil. I can work out also, I've got an MR there, I can work out my moles, this is of oil, I should say. My moles of oil, therefore, are going to be moles mass over MR, 0.23 divided by 885. And that's going to give me a number of 2.6 times 10 to the minus 4. Now what I can also do here is I've got brain water and I'm told to use experiment 1. Now experiment 1 gives me the volume of brain water used. So 39.4. Concentration is moles over volumes. So moles is concentration times volume. So moles of bromine water is going to be uh, concentration 2 times 10 to the minus 2 times 39.4. Obviously, taking into account, we need to convert that, and that's going to give us a number of moles of bromine. So I know that this number of moles of oil required this number of moles of bromine, ultimately. So all I'm looking for is a ratio of oil to bromine. So my ratio currently is 2.6 times 10 to the minus 4 to 7.9 times 10 to the minus 4. And when I look at that ratio-wise, if I divide by the smallest number, which is this one, I come out with a ratio of 1 to 3. So I know, therefore, that for every one molecule, ultimately, of oil that I had, I required three molecules of bromine water, which therefore means I must have had three double bonds in there to require the three bromine molecules. So there we go. Three. Easy. It's not too bad actually. A lot harder when I looked at it than actually it was in reality. Oh, finally on to section B. So we're on to our multiple choice now. In terms of exam, you've got to work out how long to spend on these. Obviously you've got to fill in the correct method, um, but you are not got a lot of time. You know, you've got just over sort of a minute of mark here, so you've really got to sort of plough through these as best you can. Uh, so which of these samples of gas contains large number of molecules? We'll start straight into this one. Large number of molecules. So this is essentially a PV NRT like you're gonna have to work this out for all of them. PV equals NRT. Um, work out your N because uh, you've got your pressure, you've got your volume. Bear in mind these need converting. You've got R and you've got T. Uh, it comes up that the correct answer here is B. Uh, just got to work that out. I'm not going to go through all the workings here. I'll explain how to do each one, but to try and save a bit of time, I'll just sort of skip on, unless I think one of them really needs it. Which of these substances has the permanent dipole? Which of these substances has permanent dipole-dipole attraction between molecules? Okay, so we've got CCl4. Okay, C2F4, CH3. Okay, essentially here, what you're looking for is wonkiness. Dipoles, the molecule itself needs to have a dipole. Now, this one doesn't because it's actually, it's CCL4, so the dipoles cancel each other. This one, again, they cancel. This one, they're going to cancel uh, because of the nature of how this, this is going to look, um, which is essentially going to be, because this molecule there is going to be, it's, it's just... Uh, it's tetrafluoroethane. This one's your, your carbon tetrachloride or tetrachloromethane, whatever you want to call it. So it cancels, cancels. This is going to cancel as well with our... So that's all cancelling. Nice sort of symmetrical type molecules. This is the wonky one. 
Okay, we've got a wonky molecule there, so that's going to give us permanent dipole dipole attractions, therefore. What is the total volume of gas remaining after 20 centimeters cubed ethane? I'll burn completely in 100 centimeters cubed of oxygen. All volumes measured by the same pressure and the same temperature, which is above 100 centimeters cubed. <laughs> so this is quite a clever little question. It's actually easier than it looks. Because you've got all volumes measured at the same temperature and pressure, every gas, basically every gas has the same, a mole of a gas has the same uh, volume. So what you've got here is you've got, essentially you know that 20 centimetres cubed of ethane are burning. So if you've got a ratio of 1 to 2, that means that you're going to get 40 centimetres cubed of carbon dioxide being produced, and you're going to get 60. So you've got 100 centimetres cubed of gas being produced there, because this is going to be water vapour. You're reacting with what is total in total 100, but actually ratio-wise, 1 to 3.5, you're reacting 70. That means there's going to be 30 left over. So when you actually add those together, you're going to have 30 oxygen remaining, you're going to have 40 carbon dioxide, 60 water, 130, 60, 40, 30, boom. It's all based on the fact that you're looking at ratios between them, and it's the fact that each of these, in any gas, uh, one mole of that gas has the same volume, so actually you can do this directly with these because they're at the same pressure, same temperature, etc. 11. Consider the reaction between propene and hydrogen bromide to form the major product, which species is formed in the mechanism of this reaction. Draw a quick thing of propene. Draw that there. Major product in this case is going to be... Uh, we're going to have the carbocation there, so we're going to form that as our bromine portion there. So... Oh, sorry, it's which species is formed, so it's the species, so it's the carbocation portion that we're looking for. Uh, it's going to be this one here, it's going to be C. Because there, when we have the carbocation there, we end up with two alkyl groups there. Positive inductive effect gives us a nice situation where this is a more stable molecule. If it's on the end, it's not a stable, it only has one, although it's a bigger alkyl group, it still has the same effect. Only one alkyl, uh, one positive inductive effectiveness things. 12. Which of these substances reacts most rapidly to produce silver halide precipitate with acetylide silver nitrate? Which of these substances reacts most rapidly to produce a silver halide precipitate with acidified silver nitrate? So which is going to be rap most rapidly? So essentially we're going to have this one. And I think my reason for that one is that this is this going to be the, it's the largest molecule Therefore, uh, I'd say it's probably got the weakest bond there. Therefore, it's more easily more easily stolen away uh, to produce the silver iodide. Thirteen. Which statement about E one two dichloroethene is correct? Okay. Well, we can't say that. It's got a different structural formula, so I would say that's not going to be right. That's the same IR spectrum. No, because that's the fingerprint region. It is a different molecule, different structure. Therefore, it's going to arrange. It's going to be affected differently. So, no, they're expecting you to understand that that's the fingerprint region there. As molecular ion peak different from that of. No, it would have the same molecular ion peak because it has the same ultimately, same molecule. It's just the arrangement. So it's got to be this one. It's got to be that one. It's got to be B on that one. We're saying about ethane is correct. It has no geometric isomers because there is free rotation around the carbon carbon double bond. It reacts with HBr and nucleophilic. Well, that's definitely wrong. There is no free rotation around there at all. There's restricted rotation in all alkene situations there. Uh, it burns the itself to produce carbon oxide and water. Well, that would be correct, so I think that's going to be right. And that's just, that's just tripe. So we've got to have this one. Lovely. Because it's just a carbon, a carb uh, just a hydrocarbon. Different structure there, but it's a hydrocarbon. Which statement about ethanol is correct? It reacts with tolerance agents to form silver. Now, I would straight away, I'm thinking, yeah. So I'm going to say, yeah, on that one, but I'm going to check the rest. No, it's not going to have a higher boiling point. No, so it's got to be that one, yeah. Straight away, you can see the tolerance agent, boom. 15, nice. 16, which of these substances not produced a greenhouse effect? Uh, gut feeling there, straight away, I'm looking at nitrogen, yeah. Water vapor is one of these misnomers that actually does produce, um, it does have an impact on the. Uh, greenhouse effect and ultimately global warming. Question 17 and 18 are about a method that can be used to prepare ethylamine or ethylamine. Okay, which of the curly arrows the mechanism is not correct? Which of these is not correct? Ah, straight away, four. Boom! This guy. 
four. Yeah, sneaky fool. Should be moving this way. Should be doing that, but it's not. Which statement about the reaction is not correct? Oh, ethylamine is a primary amine. Ethylamine is a primary amine, so that is correct. So that's therefore an incorrect answer. That's confusing. The mechanism is a nucleophilic substitution. That is nucleophilic substitution, therefore that is we're looking for the incorrect statement. Now this one, we'd want to use an excess of ammonia to prevent further reaction. So actually this is the incorrect one. If we use the excess bromoethane, we will produce subsequent uh, substitution reactions that will be a nightmare. 1920 about Maxwell's distribution of Boltzmann, shown in figure 3, A, B, C and D. Which be letter best represents the mean energy of the molecules? Okay, so yeah, this is one of the, they, they love this question. That's the average energy, and it's going to be this one, so it's going to be that one there, so it's going to be C. But people often get tripped up because they look at this one. Oh, this is the highest peak. This is the most uh, likely energy, or well, it's the number of molecules that have that energy, so it's the most likely energy to have is, is B, but it's not the average. The average, obviously, and the average isn't going to be this way. It's got to be skewed by this massive big whoop that way. Uh, 20, what does the area under the curve represent? total number straight away you should just know that off the top of your head boom total number of particles no excuses I think oh god still going that was it the apparatus in figure 4 was set up to measure the time taken for 20 centimetres cubed of sodium thiosulfate solution metric and the time of start when the sodium thiosulfate was added to the conical fire the time was stopped when it was no longer possible to it across the paper okay what is likely to decrease the accuracy of the experiment okay so we're reacting it with acid so they're suggesting that you rinse the flask of acid no that's going to skew your results massively it's that stupid the rest of them should have no impact um, or very little impact 22 the experiment was repeated at 20 centimeters 20 degrees Celsius using so we're using a 100 centimeter cubed conical flask at 20 centimeter 20 degrees Celsius so same temperature but we're using a bigger conical flask so therefore in theory you would guess that the the surface of this bottom point is going to be greater therefore it's going to be thinner the volume of liquid is going to appear thinner or more shallow Therefore, you would probably suspect that it would be yeah, at a time would probably decrease. Sorry, no, the time will increase. Yeah, time's going to increase on that one um, because you're going to have to let that that same well, that's the same obviously same reaction. It's going to have to get considerably darker um, for actually to have the same effect on blocking out the cross. Oh, look at that end of questions. Right, there we go. Not sure how long that's taken, but uh, there you go. That is paper two. Uh, as always, hope that's been of some help. Um, there you go.